Psalm chapter number 25. You grateful for the Word of God this morning? Amen. I was thinking about it. If you were looking for anything on this earth that's perfectly true, perfectly pure, and perfectly trustworthy that you could just count on, um, it's in short supply. Amen. Amen. But we do have that in the Word of God, and I'm thankful for that this morning. We're going to read the entire psalm of Psalm number 25, if you'll stand with me as we read this. Just 22 short verses. We have a psalm of David here, and uh, just going to share a few thoughts from this psalm this morning that might encourage us in this day and age in which we live. Verse number 1, it says, Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed, let not mine enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed, let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Show me thy ways, O Lord, teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth, and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindnesses, for they have been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore will he teach sinners in the way. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Mine eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn thee unto me, and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. O bring thou me out of my distresses. Look upon mine affliction and my pain, and forgive all my sins." Consider mine enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with cruel hatred. O keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in thee. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait on thee. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning that we do have a place that we can run, a refuge and a strong rock. And we're just thankful this morning that you have given us that in your Son, Jesus Christ, that we might flee to him for hope, for grace, for mercy. And Lord, in all of our time of affliction and distress, when our iniquities and our sins encompass us and seem great, and our enemies are many, that, Father, we have a place of consolation and hope, a place of peace, that we can rest in safety while we wait on you to deliver us. Father, we're thankful for that this morning. Pray that as we spend this time this morning reflecting on your word, that your Holy Spirit might meet with us, might teach us. Lord, that is our hope this morning. Just pray that it might be so for Jesus Christ's name and for his glory's sake. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. A lot of things in this psalm that are, uh, that are good for us to remember, but um, in light of everything that he's saying... The primary thought that comes to me as reading through this psalm is the fact that the man of God uh, desires to know the ways of the Lord. If there's something that sets apart uh, any men, knowing that all men are sinners, those who have turned to Christ in faith and have believed the gospel and have trusted in the goodness of God towards them in Christ have seen that God desires to teach us some things. The Bible says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You have to be humble to be taught anything, right? You have to be willing to listen to what someone has to say. And David here as king is lifting up his soul to the Lord, and he's asking this, that the Lord would show him his ways and teach him his paths. And that's really what I want to think about this morning. Each and every one of you in this congregation, and I myself, are journeying through our life and we take certain steps along the way and those steps ultimately lead us to different places in life the reason that 
all of us uh, are at different places in life as we've taken different steps, right? No two people that have ever lived have taken the same steps necessarily. But the psalmist here understanding that the wisdom that he needs is from the Lord because it's from him. And it's interesting when we begin to understand how the psalmist and even his son Solomon spoke of wisdom and spoke of the things of the Lord that are found in his word, that they understood that there's a lot of things that seem smart to men, but are void of wisdom. There's a lot of things that seem intellectual to men, but are void of wisdom. And because of this, and, and Satan knows this, but because of the pride of men's hearts, we are left to believe often that things that are intellectual and smart and scholarly are in fact wise. But God shows us from his word, it's not the case at all. It's not the case at all. It's a deception. It's a deception that men fall for all the time. That scholarliness equates to wisdom. And it's absolutely not the case. And we, call, we even call it higher learning, don't we? If you're going to go to university and you're going to apply your intellect to try to sharpen your usefulness in the world, you're going to go to an institution of higher learning, right? Isn't that nice? It really plays well to our pride because then we get to talk about uh, all the higher learning that we have acquired by reason of using the world's system of education. And education and the pursuit of man, and it's interesting as we observe time, right? And I'm getting to an age where I'm seeing more things play out over time, and it's fascinating uh, to watch the world unfold because the world is also on a path. Amen? So what David is asking was that he might walk in the paths of the Lord, that he would teach him his ways. But there are... Uh, there are two ways that Christ spoke about. We've talked about this a little bit at length lately. There is the broad way, and it ends in death, leads to destruction. And there's a narrow way that leads to life. David is saying, I don't have it in me to discern my way. Now, if we could just get children of God to that place today would be a big step. I don't have the wisdom to discern my way. I don't have the understanding to discern how I ought to go. I don't have the intellect or the wisdom, the foresight to see beyond this moment to know this choice versus that choice and where will that ultimately lead me in my life. I think young people uh, are most easily victimized in this way is that thinking that I know what I want and what I want must in turn be best for me because I've chosen it for myself. And young people, you need to realize that old people, hopefully, have already learned this. Just because you want it doesn't mean it's a way that you should walk in. There is something to be said for understanding your own nature and realizing that your heart will deceive you and will choose things for itself that is not good for you. They are not the ways of God, but they seem appealing. Man, we live in a deceptive age. Right. If you stop and try to begin to unpack all of the deception, I mean, I think about what the Lord said in his word about in the last days that men will be deceiving and deceiving each other, led into deception, and the deceivers are even deceived, and there's so much deceit in our time. If you were to start to try to, to actually understand and comprehend how much the mystery of iniquity is at work it is astounding to realize the depth and the length of it and it has tentacles everywhere it has i mean it, it is in everything there is deception in all things on this earth and it is all leading to one thing and that is destruction and the older I get, the less and less I trust the institutions of men, Amen. the doctrines of men, the intellect of men, the scholarship of men, the institutions of learning of men, the governments of men. I don't trust any of them. They're all corrupt, and they're all full of deceit. 
and deceiving one another. I mean, look at our government that we're, we're so proud of, uh, the wisdom that our founders had in setting up this wonderful institution of government that we have that's been corrupted. I mean, it's being run by children. I mean, it's being run by children. And this, while other serious-minded nations of the earth are actually governing their nations and, and doing things uh, as according to the flesh to strengthen their position in the world, uh, what are we doing? It's, it's just nonsense. It's completely nonsensical. Uh, and many have been sucked in trying to prop up and preserve that institution, um, and it may all be for naught. But we have a higher calling than that in this life as children of God. That's a small example, but deceit is everywhere. I think the psalmist David knew that. I think he understood that. There's deceit everywhere. I want you to focus particularly on verses 4 and 5 this morning. He says, show me thy ways, O Lord. Whose ways are they? God's ways. If you are going to see them, who's going to reveal them to you? The Lord. He said his ways are not our ways. They're past finding out. In other words, you can't discover them. But as Paul said, even the things that haven't entered into the heart of man, God has revealed unto us by his spirit. So they're past finding out. We're not going to discover them. But by his spirit, he's able to show us the truth of his ways. David understood when he came to the Lord that he is poor, he is needy, and he is desperate. Uh, he understood his condition. He understood the place he was in. And he's really beseeching the Lord to do this, not for his sake, but for the greatness of God's name. You'll notice he, as he opens this psalm that he says, I trust in thee, right? David was not ashamed of the God in whom he trusted. He publicly and openly and often would proclaim his confidence and trust in Jehovah God. Why? Because he said, let not mine enemies triumph over me and let me not be ashamed. What's he saying? He's saying, I've publicly made profession that you are my confidence. So, so he's, not, he's not trying to uh, take a soft approach to this. He's been very open in public and declared the name of God among the congregation, as it were. And he's very openly said all this, knowing that God would, for his own name's sake, do him good. Now, did David go through some things in life? Yes. yes. All of which were necessary. Some of them he brought on himself. But all of them, he would always come to this place where he's making supplication to God for God to preserve him, for God to show him, for God to teach him. Notice what he says in verse number 5. Lead me in thy what? <coughs> Truth and... <coughs> Teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Now David here is saying, we go down to verse number 10, we see a kind of a similar thought. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. And then he says again in verse number 11, For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. In other words, David, as Paul did, had no confidence in the flesh. He was asking the Lord to pardon his iniquity for his own namesake. But when we get to verse number 5 and we read about, Lead me in thy truth, um, it kind of it should provoke at least the same thought that we see of Christ in John 17 when he says, Sanctify them through thy truth. And then he says what? Thy word is truth. And it's neat whenever the Lord gives us those uh, tools because we can then go back to the Psalms and things that Christ often spoke of himself. And we can use those then to interchange and understand the truth that he's speaking of. is isn't just this kind of this generic idea of the fact that there is an absolute. But he's saying specifically, lead me in thy truth. What would that then be according to Christ? That would be his word. In other words, lead me into your word. Lead me into an understanding. Lead me into the wisdom that you have laid up that is hidden from the natural man in these pages. I mean, everyone can read these pages, but some seem to benefit from the wisdom of its pages, and some seem confounded and confused by the wisdom of its pages. And what is it that makes the difference? It's the Spirit of God. David understood that. So he comes to the Lord in a humble mind, asking the Lord 
to open his understanding. In another place, we hear him asking the Lord to show him and teach him of the great things of his law. So this idea of being led in the truth, I want you to just think about that. We all know Psalm 119, 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So we're asking the Lord to give us direction. We're asking the Lord to guide our steps. And the Bible even says that every man kind of ponders his way and figures out kind of where he thinks he wants to go. But each actual step is directed by God himself. So we, at the end of the day, don't have as much authority or control over those things. How many of you have things going on in your life you didn't expect or anticipate right now? Th things that you didn't? Yeah, Jim's smiling and laughing. Yeah, stuff happening in life that you didn't have on the program. Stuff that's outside of what you anticipated when you took a step yesterday to find yourself in today, and all of a sudden the landscape's very different than you thought it was going to be. And so now you're in this moment, and you're ready to take another step. And so everything's always changing around us. So can we actually know what we ought to do? Not in and of ourselves, but we can if we take David's approach. Think of this idea in Psalm 119 when he's saying, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I want you to put that into context of your mind with 1 Corinthians 10.13. Paul says this to the church at Corinth, There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. God in his infinite wisdom and goodness has at every juncture of your life, in other words, from the little things to the big things, in every moment you find yourself and in every decision you are making, He has provided a good way. That means with every decision and everything that confronts you in life, there is a choice to be made that leads to the good way. He's, he's promised here in His Word that He's going to make a way to escape. So with every decision that confronts us, and there's a lot of difficult ones. And sometimes things don't seem to have a good answer because we're kind of stuck in this moment. But if God is good to his word, then he has said in every choice that you find yourself having to make, there is a good way and there is a temptation. Now, the primary uh, thought when we read that verse, I think, often is that the temptation means uh, kind of a specific uh, sin. In other words, I'm, I'm confronted with uh, to drink and consume a lot of alcohol or to not drink and consume alcohol, right? So this would be a temptation for some who that's a weakness for them. And we think, okay, this is a good way and I shouldn't go consume all the alcohol because drunkenness and all of those things is a sin. And so God has, there's a temptation there, but God has provided a way to escape. When we think about temptation, really, in the way that uh, I think often we see it in Scripture, the Lord Jesus Christ came to his apostles when they were sleepy in the garden. And he told them to pray that ye enter not into temptation. Now, temptation doesn't necessarily just mean that we are making this sinful choice. Temptation means also, it is that, but it also means we are following our own heart versus God's way. That's temptation. And when, you've, when you go down that path, nothing good is going to happen out of it unless God, by His mercy, does what He does best, which is do good out of evil. Because we are always messing things up. And so He and His goodness is, is always working through us in spite of us to accomplish his good will. But temptation is more than just that bad choice you make. Temptation is following your own thinking, following your own advice, following your own counsel, doing what makes sense to you. I mean, I don't know how many times I've heard, well, God, he created us with a brain and he expects us to use it. Okay, fair enough. But our brain is corrupted by sin and this is perfect is all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. This is perfect, uncorrupted, and our mind is corrupted. So if you have to rely on one, 
Which one is reliable? It's not your mind. It's the mind of Christ. It's reliable. In other words, it's consistent. In other words, it's going to always lead you down the same path. Where will your heart take you if you start following it around? You don't even know. There's many people trying that and still trying to figure out where they're headed. And guess what? They don't know. They don't know. They're just living each moment, following their heart from choice to choice, and that's called wandering through life, aimlessly through life. There's no purpose in it. But God has provided this good way. So the question then becomes temptation versus what? Well, temptation really means walking in the ways of men, walking in the ways of our own thinking and our own heart. So the, the converse to that would be what? Well, I think we have it in Psalm 1 team, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So if in every choice and in every decision, God has preserved a good way for us. How can we find it? How do we know what it is? What well, has to be by his word. Amen. This is the primary. Uh, and I talk to a lot of people uh, about the word of God and about Christ and, and things. And it's interesting how many times you hear, well, I think, yeah. well, I think, this. Right. Well, I think that. And you get in a conversation with them, and at some point you have to say, but what does God's word say? I know that's what you think, but what does God's word say? See, we're still leaning on our own intellect, and we're thinking whatever we think is actually meaningful. And it may or may not be, if it doesn't line up with God's word, it leaves us quite a bit short of where we need to be. In Proverbs 2, 6-9, it says, For the Lord giveth wisdom. So is wisdom found at seminary? No. no. Is wisdom found at university? No. no. Is wisdom found in the halls of uh, your local news channel or the national news or all the uh, experts that we bring on, the prognosticators and everybody that has all the opinions and experts? And no. Wisdom is not found in any of those places Wisdom is from God. Just thinking that God's people, at least, should hold to that view. At least God's people should hold to the view that wisdom comes from Him. It's not something that we look to the world and we think, oh, that they've got the smart people on their side. There's a lot of Christians who've been led into temptation because they've abandoned God's word because they've started listening to the smart people in the world. And I'll give you some really practical examples. Creation is a perfect example. Because all the smart people, all the smart people defy God's word and say it cannot be true. Okay, the smart people. Because of this, now almost all seminaries have changed their theology around creation. Why? Did God's word change? No, we rewrote our understanding and interpretation of it to fit the secular view. So now we've believed. Who have we believed? We believe that the world is where the smart people reside. And if they say that the, all of these things happened over millions of years, then how can I go to Scripture and interpret it so that I can make it fit together? And I've heard people say, and I've got a little bit of a problem with this, just so you know where I'm coming from. I've heard a lot of people say that, well, creation, it's not a salvation issue. Fair enough. But believing this is the truth is a salvation issue. Amen. I have a hard time accepting that you can believe evolution and believe the gospel. You go all the way to the book of Revelation and what does the book of Revelation say? That at the very end of this age, all the angels and hosts of heaven are giving praise unto the one who created all things. So creation is kind of a big deal because you either believe God's account of it or you believe man's intellect and man's wisdom and man's knowledge. So I have a hard time saying it's not a salvation issue Amen. because salvation isn't just believing the peace of God's plan that means you can benefit by what he's done in Christ and go to heaven. It means believing his word is true. Amen. Right. Jesus Christ was the word made flesh. And he said, whosoever believeth in me. 
I mean, this is a package deal. So this is either true or it's not true. And if it's not true, why are you here this morning, right? If it's not true, why go to seminary? If it's not true, why waste all the effort with religion if it's not true? And yet most colleges today will teach you that the creation account is allegorical. It's not, it doesn't mean that that's actually what happened. And that is a lie. It's a lie. The only person who was there to know has given us an account of how he did it. And you either believe his account, which, by the way, none of the science contradicts the account. Okay? None of the science contradicts the account, but all of the intellect and the thinking contradicts the account. If you look at the actual evidence, it doesn't contradict the account. Nonetheless, we go on from there. There are many such things in our world today where people have abandoned the truth of God's word because men know better, right? Men are smarter. We've figured it out. And all I'm saying is at least God's people should hold to this view. How on earth can you trust Christ with your future if he can't give an accurate account of what's happened already? Amen. Is that a fair question? Yep. If Christ can't give you an accurate portrayal of history, how on earth can we trust him with what he says about the future? You either believe him or you believe men. And by the way, our faith is not, it doesn't demand just blind ignorance. If you actually study these things with science, you'll find they are agreeable. But men's interpretation of what they see is where we get into trouble. All I'm saying is each of these choices fundamentally in your life and in the broader view of the course of humanity have big implications. Big implications. And we need to understand that. So wisdom is of the Lord, according to Proverbs. It says, Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and what? Preserveth the way of his saints. So his, who is it that will guard your steps and be a light to your feet and be a buckler unto you? And as you going through the journey of your life, because you don't know, you don't know, but the Bible says for those who trust in the Lord, he will preserve your way. That brings some peace of mind for those who have faith in Christ and understand because of the gift God gave in Christ to men, his goodwill towards us. In other words, if we're leaning on him, he's leading us to a good place. We don't have to fret and worry and concern ourselves so much with all the particulars, if we're at least walking in his way, by faith in what he has spoken in his word. And I want you to think about this, knowing that the Lord gives wisdom. Turn, if you would, to the book of 1 Corinthians. Because you look like your, uh, your hands have been idle for a while and you need to work them out. So I'll let you turn in your Bible over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. First Corinthians chapter number one, and we'll pick up our reading in verse number 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. In other words, all the things that we think. Remember what we said last week, that the things that are highly esteemed among men are what? They're abomination in the sight of God. It says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? In other words, if you're looking around at where, the, where is the scribe or the wise or the disputer of this world, you will find they are in unbelief. They're in unbelief. That's uh, important for us to understand. Why? Because of the pride of their heart. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So is the wisdom of this world actually what we need? No, it actually exalts man. I think one of the primary aims uh, of our, the adversary of God is to elevate the natural condition of man to such a state that he no longer senses any need of Christ or of God, right? To make man 
We, we've done so much to improve ourselves and as far as our standard of living goes that we're now at a place in history where almost around the globe we're continuing to elevate the condition of man to a place where we don't need God, right? We've figured it out for ourselves. We are comfortable. We have all of our needs met. We have many great wonders that we've invented. And it's also interesting when you look uh, through the Bible, you see different people that have different skills and talents and how they are used and how the Lord uses those things. Uh, but not every invention of man is necessarily good for man. Right? The more comfortable we become, the more uh, intellectual we become, is this actually producing a better state for man? Only according to the natural things. We have an easier time of it, but it may not actually be better for us. Isaiah 47.10 says something very similar, uh, and I'd like you to turn there real quickly, and then I'll sh I'm going to share a couple of final thoughts around this, because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get you to think about something. I don't think I really have you there yet, but by the time we dismiss here in the next number of minutes, that will remain undisclosed at this time. I hope that you'll be thinking about that. Pretty brief this morning, but Isaiah 47 Verse number 10. Now what's interesting here is that the, the prophet Isaiah is speaking of the destruction of Babylon. And you would know, studying your Bible, the city of confusion, uh, that this is a tale as, as old as all the way back to the Tower of Babel and Nimrod, right? And really Nimrod represented um, the desire of men and the efforts of one man particularly for all of mankind to be united under the leadership of one man. That's what the Tower of Babel was. And all the way back then, God dispersed that effort because he knew that would lead to their destruction. And where do we see Babylon going at the, at the end of history of this age? We see all of men united under the leadership of one man, just as Nimrod tried to do at the Tower of Babel. And we also see men working to reconcile all of the language barriers and all of the identities and all the things that are different that God gave to disperse, we see the efforts of men to what? To overcome those barriers and to bring all of mankind back under the leadership and headship of one man. Well, in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 47, uh, judgment is being pronounced against Babylon. And this was both immediate and the immediate Babylon of their time as well as future, which is why you can go to Revelation and read about the destruction of Babylon, right? The system of this world's wisdom and education and thinking and religion, uh, which is what Babylon was a type of. And he's speaking these things to them. He says, for thou hast trusted in thy wickedness. Now, if you want, just for context, you can imagine for yourself what you will, but a lot of these things will sound uh, like they're speaking to us in our time. Thou hast trusted in thy wickedness. Thou hast said, none seeth me. Thy wisdom and thy knowledge, it hath perverted thee. Listen, man's wisdom is a perverting, corrupting influence. Amen. Just think about that before you send your kids to university. Amen. Thy wisdom and thy knowledge, it hath perverted thee. And thou hast said in thine heart, I am and none else beside thee, beside me. Are we hearing that today? We hear it an awful lot. We hear it an awful lot. Therefore shall evil come upon thee, thou shalt not know from whence it riseth, and mischief shall fall upon thee, thou shalt not be able to put it off, and desolation shall come upon thee suddenly, which thou shalt not know. Stand now with thine enchantments, and with the multitude of thy sorceries, wherein thou hast labored from thy youth. If so be, thou shalt be able to profit, if so be, thou mayest prevail. Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. Behold, they shall be as stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm at, nor fire to sit before it. Thus shall they be unto thee, with whom thou hast labored, even thy merchants, from thy youth, they shall wander everyone to his quarter. None shall save thee. So we see at least in this, 
in this reference to Babylon, which is a type of the world's thinking and system and knowledge and wisdom, that that knowledge and wisdom of the world is a corrupting influence. It's a corrupting influence. Why? Because it leads man to uh, better his condition. And, you know, we have refrigeration and ice makers and all the conveniences. Are those things evil? No. But what is the result of all of those conveniences and luxuries being provided to men while they have wicked hearts? It's that they become perverted because they start trusting in them, which is what he's saying in verse number 10. We're trusting in the work of our own hands, trusting in the things that we have done and we have created, trusting in the power that we're able to bring to bear through those forces. Now, if you turn to Jeremiah 17, you will see an important, um, an important principle that the Lord shares with us. Jeremiah also wrote uh, about the final judgment of Babylon later in his book. But in Jeremiah chapter number 17, verse number 5, we have here two different things laid out for us. Uh, and the first one speaks to the curse, and the next one speaks to blessing. And that should sound familiar, because from the very dawn of time of creation, God has presented man with what? Two, several ways. There was the way of life, which was blessing, and the way of death, which was the curse. And all through the Bible, what do we see? We see those things presented to man. We see him confronted with the choice of what he's going to walk in and choose. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in... What do you see nowadays? See, this is, this is part of the issue, and I'm not bashing Google. I'm saying, know your enemy. Amen. So, just understand, you need to know your enemy. But the children of God today are more inclined to Google an answer to their problem than to look in God's Word. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. Using Google is a way of life for God's people today, right? Because it gives you access to knowledge. And so we're very quick to utilize the tool, but is there a hazard in that? We rely on it. Yeah, I mean, it becomes the way we live our life. My question is this. Imagine yourself through the course of a week in a journal writing down every time you Google something to figure something out. And then in a second column next to that, write down every time you search the scriptures for an answer to something in your life. And just keep a log and say, where am I at? Do I know my enemy? Because he is a subtle enemy. Is Google evil? Well, corporately, you could probably make the, the argument that yes, I think there's a case to be made there. But the tool itself, it's a tool. You can, I get on Blue Letter Bible through that tool all the time, right? You can find a lot of things in there that are useful. But I'm just saying in our thinking and in our mind, Google does not hold the wisdom to the ways of life. But we've so easily adopted and accepted that tool. But for children of God, what is the foundation by which we live? It's got to be God's word has to be God's word, and I'm leading you somewhere with that, so just hang on to that thought. But the Lord says, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man. Now I hear all kinds of things today about why well, the U.S. is the greatest nation that's ever been on the earth. And, and all the reasons why, and all the reasons that I can hear continually, tend to be because of the things we've done. And why we think no one can touch us, right? We're un completely untouchable. United States, we're just going to go on forever. You know, I sit a queen and she'll be no widow and all that. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but the Bible still says that you're under a curse if you're trusting in man. It brings a curse, not a blessing. So be careful with that. And maketh flesh his arm and whose heart departeth from the Lord. There's the temptation. There's the temptation. When your heart has departed from the Lord, you have succumbed to temptation. You're now vulnerable and can very easily fall to any number of attacks from the adversary. For he shall be like the heath in the desert and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land and not inhabited. Conversely, blessed is the man that trusteth what? In the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. 
For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when he cometh. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding her fruit. And it's in the context of those two things being set against one another that we have verse number 9, which we all know. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So that verse is spoken in the context of Basically, men, who are you trusting in? Are you under the curse or are you under the blessing? The the hope and the confidence of the child of God has to be in his word. Now, where that gets interesting, um, because I want you to turn to Psalm 119, 140. Because I don't think that that's uh, necessarily news to any of you, right? I mean, I don't think any of you have heard anything... That's surprising, but good reminders, yes? Good things to be put in remembrance of. Knowing that God with every temptation hath made a way to escape. And how are we going to know and be able to identify that way? By the help of His Spirit, through the light of His Word. It's got to be that. We're not going to figure it out on our own any other way. So if we have His Spirit and we're walking in the light of His Word, then have we confidence towards God. That He is directing our steps and guiding our feet. That we are walking in the ways that He would have us to walk so that we can be uh, useful in His service. So when you get to the idea of um, really trusting in the Word of God is what it all comes down to. In Psalm 119, 140, I've got to turn another page because it's a really long chapter. I didn't quite get there. It says, Thy Word is what? Very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Okay, so keeping that in mind, turn over a couple of pages to Proverbs chapter number 30. In verse number 5 of Proverbs 30, it says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in in him add thou not unto his words lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar now this is uh, on top of just the the admonition this morning to carefully consider how often in your life are you making choices right how often are you making choices based on the word of god is it is it the governing principle and foundation by which you live your life so we we know from god's word if we're not coming to god's word and standing on this right and we're leaning on our own thinking and our own understanding whatever it is we are vulnerable right there's there's so much and i and i wish i had time to labor in this more for you but there's so much deceit the earth is filled with it today It is filled with it. And how are you going to know if you're being deceived? Apart from God's word, you won't. You could be deceived by the world. You could be deceived by the adversary. You can be deceived by your own heart. How are you going to know? You got to measure it up against God's word. So are we using God's word as a foundation to teach us the ways that we should think, the way that we should live? Are we following after him? In faith, praying for His Spirit to give us understanding, to give us wisdom, to give us knowledge. We need it. The the most dangerous thing about our point in time in history is that people don't think they need it. You know, people want to come to church and they want a worship experience. It's interesting in God's Word that He said He's exalted His Word above His name. Nowadays, we see a lot of churches who want to come together to praise His name but make no place in their service for his word. Does that line up with scripture is all I'm saying. If we were to look at scripture and say, what is the purpose of coming together? Is it to look to his word and exalt his word or just to praise his name? You wouldn't have to search too far or too deeply to realize the purpose of coming together is to gather around his word, praying his spirit. But what do people want? They don't care. I mean, generally speaking, for the most part, I had an interesting conversation with a young man at Kimray the other day 
who is looking for uh, a church. And a lot of his friends uh, are inviting him to this place, and that's kind of where he wants to go. And he has a wife. He has a responsibility for a wife, for a child. And so we had a really good conversation about what is a church, first of all, because we've totally lost that idea as well. So let's start with the basics. What is a church? Then know that, hey, it's great to go where your friends are, and it's great to go where the fun is, and it's great to go where the praise and the worship and the best music is. But just know when you get to the Bible and you look at the book of Revelation, by the time we get to the end of the age, the church of Laodicea, there is a lot of churches doing a lot of activity who have completely abandoned the faith. Right. Don't get sucked into that. Amen. There's a lot riding on that. I mean, what we need is God's word. And just because it's lost favor with the culture of our time, it doesn't tell us so much about the relevance of God's word. It tells us about the culture of our time. We kind of sometimes get things backwards. It's not about us deciding what God's word's place ought to be in life. It's using God's word to see where we're at in life. Because this is the only sure foundation. It's the only fixed point that you can navigate around anything else. I mean, it's the North Star, if you will. The fixed thing in, the, in all of our experience on this earth, it's the one fixed place that is sure. Amen. I mean, scientists prove themselves wrong every 10 years or so. And they're like, I don't know how many documentaries we watch. We, we enjoy watching documentaries. And it's interesting, they'll say, we used to think yada, yada, yada. But now we think this. And of course, anyone who doesn't think this with us now is a moron. Because obviously, we've completely solved it. And then somewhere towards the end, they'll say something like this. There's still a lot we don't understand. Yeah. I'm a f yeah, I know. That's terrifying. So stop mocking everyone who disagrees with your point of view if you don't understand a lot of things. I, I know one who understands all things. Amen. And while I may not understand everything he says, I know he's telling me the truth. Right. right? So let's stick with that. So where I want to end this morning is with this idea. If every word of God is pure and the word of God is very pure and we're going to be sanctified by the truth and the word is truth and if we have to measure everything in life against the word of God to know if we're being deceived or not. I want you to I want you to just with me stop and take a step back from the moment of history in which you're currently ensnared and just look at the broader context of what is happening. Because deceit is running rampant. Just take a step back and ask yourself, what is going on? And the words that keep resounding in my mind are the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ when he said, an enemy hath done this. Right. I mean, just take one step back. Because this is we live in a time that is a... I mean, it's astonishing how deeply the roots of deceit go. And you're never going to sort it all out. Yeah. You're never going to sort it all out. But if we know that the Word of God is the source of truth, then what do we make of all of this sudden, in the last 50, 60 years, men's sudden in, uh, uh, infatuation with the idea of changing the Word of God? I mean, men have become fascinated with changing it, changing the word. If every word of God is pure, and if the word is very pure, and if God gave us his word to be the truth by which we are sanctified, why the sudden need to change it so much? And look, this is where we get, we get sucked into these ideas of, uh, we'll take this KJV and Bible, and when we'll put it against the NIV or the NASB, and we look at all these individual uh, iterations that keep coming out, and then we try to figure out where the where the intricacies are and, and what's missing, and and it's not hard to do that. There's a lot of stuff absent new Bibles because it's an entirely different manuscript that they're translating from. But the question is is less for me getting in and competing with every version. We know the history of this Bible. We know where it came from. We understand its history. The Message Bible, right? I mean, just, just think about where things are going. Because you live in a moment of time, but our adversary has a lot of experience. 
He doesn't mind a decade, two decades, three. Where is all of this changing of the word and removing passages and adding in words? Where's all that going? It can only be going towards destruction. It can only be part of the end time deception that's going to come on all the world. I mean, it, it's impossible to think that the spirit behind that is the spirit of our God. And what you'll find if you start doing much history and study on the issue is that the vast majority of men involved in Bible translation work these days and for the past 50 years are unbelievers. The people giving you your NIV, your NASB, your ESV, your RSV, all of those, the people giving you all of those don't believe this is the word of God. Right. Is that a problem for anybody? Amen. I'm just saying it's, I don't think we understand how necessary this is. But the gospel is going to continue to be preached. And I kind of wonder, as things wind down in this age of history, and where all, I mean, it seems obvious to me where that's going. You now have a, a Bible the, any of the modern Bibles that you, that you buy, you now have a Bible in your hands that for the first time in human history that the Catholic Church has been around, they don't mind you owning a copy. Isn't that weird? They're fine with all the modern Bibles that are being pushed out. They're approved by the Catholic Church. The same church that used to kill people for possessing this, or for translating this, they're now fine. Why? See, there's something going on. There's, there's a broader scope of history, and there's a broader scope of attack, and there's a broader scope of work, the mystery of iniquity that was already at work in Paul's day. What is, what's the mystery of iniquity? Right? It's been at work for a long time, and it's all going to come to a head, and part of it is getting to a place where everybody can agree on one Bible, regardless of your doctrinal preferences. Is that problematic? I think it's tremendously problematic. I mean, if we live in a time when people are not afraid to change and to alter God's very word, where does that tell us we're at in history? I think it speaks, it speaks a lot. Should God's people know their Bibles better? Many people don't even know what the Bible is. Should we know it better? I don't know that we can overstate. I'll end with this. I don't know that we can overstate the importance of this book. I don't think you can, you can say it in a way that puts it too seriously, the importance of this book. I mean, if you have the words of God and you're seeking him and he by his spirit is, is able to lead you into the ways of truth so that you can be set apart from the world, what is it that sets you apart? It's his word. But if those words have been altered and changed and mixed with men's words, with men's ideas, at what point is it no longer God's word? Right? If you're, if you're changing it, at some point it's not God's words anymore. If Christ spoke of the jot and the tittle being important, then is he particular about the grammar of his word? I'll give you an example. Uh, do, do, does one word make a difference? Well, it did to Moses because he was told to speak to the rock. And he smote the rock. I want you to see something. Numbers 20. We'll finish, we'll finish right here. <laughs> in verse number 8, the Lord is, of chapter 20 in the book of Numbers, the Lord is commanding um, what they are to do. And he says, You and Aaron your brother, speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. 
and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him, and Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. Makes me wonder if he smote it the first time and nothing happened. And they smote it again. Anyways, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank in their beasts also. All's well that ends well, right? Nope. All's well that ends well. You know, it's really the results we're after uh, and how we get from here to there. It's not material. Look what Lord, the Lord's response is. The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, because ye... I want you to read those next three words for me, please. Does it matter if we change some of God's word? Does it matter if we have good reasons for thinking that why it's a good idea? Can, is it possible that men, as easily deceived as we are, could be deceived into doing something we think is a good idea, but we're being led of the wrong spirit? Yes. It's not only possible, it's the most likely. It's the most likely. He says, because ye believed me not. Think of Lot's wife. The Lord told him one time, don't look back. Was that a big, big part of what he told them to do? She left. She looks back. Don't look back. See, we often, I think, think the little things, you know, we can disagree. Well, I, can, I know we can. I'm just saying it's not inconsequential. What man wants is to be able to disagree and it's inconsequential. But that's not the case. So without getting into a full depth study, which I would encourage you to do on your own about all the modern Bibles, I just want you to understand as these new versions continue to come out, it's not about that one particular version. This is a strategy of the enemy to sow confusion, to sow discord, to sow error, to take all kind of things out of Scripture. So that it becomes what? Listen, this is the whole deal. The whole deal of adding men's thoughts to this book is to make it unreliable. That's right. I'm telling you right now, I may not live to see it. I don't know if I'll be here and, and if it'll happen in my lifetime. But there's a generation coming up in the world that is going to come to a place in history when the book that they hold that is called a Bible is going to be demonstrably unreliable because all of the errors they have intentionally introduced to it. For example, when you have Jesus going up to the feast and he says, I go not yet up to the feast. In the newer versions it says, I go not up to the feast. And then he goes. Is he a liar? Is he not a liar? Are those words significant? I'm just saying there are a thousand such examples, and it may not happen in my life. There's enough of a contingency still fervent for the true word of God that are, that are trying to understand what is happening in our time, but the adversary is clear with his intentions, and there's coming a time in history when this book will have been corrupted to the point it no longer is reliable, and we're already there. We're already there. We're already to that moment of history. We're already that place in time. The, the work that's going on by all of the largest Bible societies in the world are now spreading Bibles that have been translated not to be God's word, but to convey the intent of what God said. And guess who got to decide what the intent was? People that don't believe this is God's word. That's all you need to know. So all I'm saying is if we just take one step back, I don't know that I can convey to you how dire the situation is, but it's serious. I mean, we see everything else moving towards this uh, moment of time at the end of the age when the iniquity has come to the full, the Bible says, and that judgment is going to come because there's no remedy. When you no longer have a pure word of God, Mankind is without remedy. 
And that's exactly where this age is headed. And it's not an accident. These are not people trying to help you understand God's word. These are people who don't believe God's word who are tinkering with it. And it may be subtle and small at first, but where it's all headed is easy to see. The earth will be full of books called the Bible. The Holy Bible. The Bible is just Latin for book, right? So the Holy Bible. But this corruption that's already begun will continue to spread, and evil men will wax worse and worse until there is no remedy other than judgment. So if you're going to stand on something, know what you're standing on. And if you've decided it's important, make it important. Know that when you're choosing things in your life, God has provided a way of escape. And it will always be found through his word. If we're not following his word, then we've already been led into temptation because we think we're able to stand. Does that make sense? We already have been deceived. We've already been led astray. We've already been uh, walked down the path because we've bought the lie that we, we know enough. We're wise enough. We've learned enough. Look, you could learn a lot about this book, but it is not enough to protect you. What you've learned about it is not enough to protect you. Without the Spirit's work in your life continually guiding you and directing you, it's not enough. What you have learned in the past, what, you, what knowledge you possess in your mind is not enough faculty to know how to live your life. I want you to think about this as we dismiss. Let's all stand. I'll let you at least stand. That's got to mean we're close. Think about this. And this has actually been, well, I guess not. Think about this. All of the, uh, all the man-made things we do to try to protect ourselves, even when, when good intentions are applied, always fall short. And I can prove it to you. Think of all of the denominations, all the denominations that men have stood up, and what have they done? They put together uh, creeds, they put together statements of faith, they put together all these things that are intended to what? Be a defense. Have they been a defense? It's easy to see they're not a defense. I think that's sobering and enlightening that the man-made stuff that we tried to put together to be a defense for the truth is not a defense. It hasn't stood the test of time. It's been corrupted. It's been perverted. It's been overthrown. uh, And all of those denominations are now moving back right to where they came from. It's just fascinating to see over time how all these things play out. The only defense for a child of God is this. It's his word. That's the defense. It has to be his word and his spirit, and that's how he's going to work with us, in us, and through us. Amen? Brother Adam, if you come, we'll have a verse of invitation this morning.